um, we'll get started today with a new topic. Hopefully you can all hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start a new topic today, and that is ecology. Um, I'm hoping to complete it in the two hours that we have, but if we don't, we may spill over into the next um, So we'll probably spill over into the next week, maybe for half an hour or one hour. So I'm going to share my content over here. Like I said, we're going to start a new topic today, and that is ecology. So some of you may have studied this before, but we're going to go through some very basic stuff. I'm not going to go into any of the um, details about ecology. We're just going to cover those aspects that are relevant directly to environmental science. So this is an outline of what we're going to cover. We are going to look at the definitions of ecology and ecosystems. What are the components of an ecosystem? What are the different types of ecosystems? What is called an ecological hierarchy? What is the law of the minimum? Primary productivity and population growth models. So there are two models that we're going to look at and uh, you'll be able to understand why. Um, the book that I'm using for this particular part of the course is by Kormandi. I mentioned it in the previous uh, week. Uh, the first six chapters and part of seven is what we're going to cover. The book is pretty easy. It's uh, available as well. It's easily available and it's pretty easy reading. So uh, I think many of you will enjoy it. All right, so let's start with the definitions. Why do we study ecology? What is the meaning of the word ecology? Eco literally means uh, it's the Greek word for home or place to live or habitat, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, ecology literally means the study of organisms in their home. So we normally translate it as the habitat. What does the organism do in its habitat and all of that? So. Um, what does the science involve? The science is basically the study of the interrelationships between living organisms and their environment. We use two words and that is living organisms represent the biotic part of the environment. So anytime you see the word biotic, it means we are dealing with either a single species or a multiple uh, group of organisms or species and so on. So biotic means living anything that has to do with living organisms and the environment includes both. It includes both living organisms as well as non-living parts of the environment. Now, you probably know this by now, but it's worth repeating that living organisms modify their environment and the environment forces them to adapt themselves to the different conditions. So even if you look at your own lives, you look at your room, do you modify it? Yes, of course. Are you adapting to certain uh, things within your room and your environment? Yes. So that is exactly what is happening even in nature. So it's basically this give and take between the living organism and the both living as well as non-living parts of the environment. Then we come to the word ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a self-contained community of organisms and their non-living environment. So you have the biotic plus the abiotic part of the environment. Together they are called the ecosystem. We're defining ecosystem in terms of mass and energy. So our fundamental laws, the law of conservation of mass and energy is literally what we use to define how a particular ecosystem works. So you create a boundary. It's an arbitrary boundary like any boundary that we create in any kind of system, whether it's a physical system, any type of system. So an ecosystem follows the same rules. You create a boundary. It may be arbitrary. 
and you define what is the input of mass and energy in and out of the system. Now, in an ecosystem, we are interested in the nature of what is inside the system. Is it being impacted by the flow of mass and energy in and out of the system? So we have abiotic parts, that's the non-living part and the living part. And like I said, together, they are affecting each other and that will determine the population, that will determine the food availability, that will determine the nature of decomposition. All these things will be determined by uh, the flows of mass and energy in and out of the system. It will also determine the degree of functional stability. Um, I'll give you two examples and both of them are something that I uh, have, uh, you know, something that I've been involved with. So let us say I'm growing a bacterial culture in the lab. Now it's a flask, it's a batch culture. I add in a certain amount of nutrients, I add in a certain amount of bacteria, I input it in the incubator. And in a sense, it's a very, very simple ecosystem. How is it functionally stable? There's no functional stability at all. OK, because there will be changes. There will be daily variations in terms of its stability. There is zero stability. You look at a forest. You go to, go there today, you go there five years later, 10 years later, more or less, if there is very little impact of, let's say, anthropogenic activities, you will find that it's functionally stable. OK, so that is what we mean that more or less is it constant? Is it self sustaining? Is it able to um, retain its? Um, how shall I put it? Retain the populations in the same proportions. OK, so all that is the functional stability of any given ecosystem. And the ecosphere by definition is the aggregation of all ecosystems on the planet. We use the word biosphere or ecosphere interchangeably, I think there's no difference. So that's the aggregation of all of them. Here is our generic ecosystem. So anytime you want to talk about any particular ecosystem, these are the basic components of that particular system. So what is the driving force? Where is the energy that fuels any ecosystem? Where is it coming from? For the planet, it's coming from the sun. OK, so we are living in a, an ecosystem that is or an ecosphere that is totally driven by solar energy. What is the group of organisms that is capable of converting solar energy as well as carbon dioxide into biomass? So all the organisms together that are going to convert carbon dioxide to organic biomass, they are called producers and the energy that is used is solar energy. So they are not using chemical energy. They are converting solar energy to chemical energy. Are we capable of doing that? We are not capable of doing that. So we are human beings as well as so many other living organisms are all dependent on the producers. The producers are also called autotrophs. Auto means self and trough means food. So they create their own food. So all producers, these, this is very important because when we talk about productivity on the planet, this is what we are talking about. We're talking about primary productivity. This is the bottom of the food pyramid. And if this gets damaged, then obviously all through the food pyramid, there will be damage. And that is what is important from the environmental perspective. So, these producers, which are also autotrophs because they're self feeding, they do not need to feed on other living organisms. So they are the first trophic level and all living organisms that are dependent on other living organisms for food will be at the second, third, fourth or higher trophic levels. So trophic means food and therefore uh, any organism that is dependent on either the producers or the higher trophic levels is basically uh, not a producer. It's a uh, heterotroph. So they are, they can be herbivores, they can be carnivores, omnivores, 
you know the uh, meanings. I think most of you have studied all this in your uh, high school. Herbivores are the ones that eat only plants. Uh, omnivores are the ones that eat living flesh as well as um, plants. And carnivores are the ones that eat flesh only. So that's basically those are the definitions. Um, eventually, all living organisms die. And when they die, they have to be decomposed. So the decomposer organisms, there can be any number of decomposing organisms. The biggest groups are bacteria and fungi. So these are the microorganisms that cause decomposition of dead biomass. And there are higher organisms. So you have worms and insects and beetles and uh, birds and so many other animals that are capable, what we call scavengers. So these scavenging organisms include microorganisms as well as higher organisms. So these decomposing organisms will eventually return all the biomass back into what we call the nutrient pool. And without this nutrient pool, any ecosystem will come to a full stop, literally. So without this part of the process, there is no return or recycling of the nutrients. So these decomposers will eventually cause the biomass to go back into some of the most oxidized forms or uh, it can be even reduced forms. So it will return all the elements. If you think about the elements that are um, there in all biomass, you have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, iron. The list is almost the entire periodic table. Not everything is useful, but um, barring about 10 to 20 exceptions, most of the elements in the periodic table can be considered either macro or micronutrients. So anyway, uh, the decomposers will bring the biomass including all these essential elements back into the nutrient pool for the life processes to continue. What is the ecosystem dependent on? What is it affected by? The abiotic factors that will have a huge impact on the nature of the ecosystem and on the kind of um, the kinds of species that will survive in the ecosystem, all of that is determined by climatic factors. So the geographic location, temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, topography, all these are some of the factors that will determine the nature of the ecosystem. Um, the energy flow is unidirectional. So remember, it's sunlight that is Fueling, there are exceptions, there are pockets, there are extreme environments where you get the energy from geothermal sources, you can get energy from wind and other things, but uh, we're not going to go into that. that. Those are very specific, very local conditions on the whole for the planet as, an, as a broad generalization, sunlight is what drives the ecosphere. And uh, the mass, like I said, is what I was talking about is mass flow. So mass flow by definition has to be cyclic because any time there is an impediment to the flow of mass, that ecosystem will eventually die. OK, so unless that flow of mass and the cyclic flow of mass is maintained, the ecosystem dies. And uh, the orange arrows represent both energy as well as mass. OK. So just to remind you of something that you have studied many times, what is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is the conversion of CO2 and water to biomass. So this biomass is represented in the form of carbohydrate, a generic carbohydrate, so CH2O, and in the process. Now, there are exceptions to what is shown over here. This is again a very broad generalization based on what you already know. Um, in microbiology, we show and study different um, exceptions to this rule. But what you are familiar with <coughs> is that green plants will take up carbon dioxide and water and convert it to biomass. And in the process, they will release oxygen. And this entire process is driven by sunlight. And chlorophyll is the uh, method by which 
solar energy is converted to chemical energy. So when I say carbohydrates, let's say glucose is one of the carbohydrates that is generated. So it's basically a source of energy, right? You know that when you take sugar, it's getting converted to energy and that's what you survive on. So that is a simple example. It involves the oxidation of uh, literally oxidation of oxygen and reduction of carbon. So carbon is in C4, uh, 4 plus oxidation state and it gets reduced to zero in glucose. So it's the reduction of carbon and the oxidation of oxygen. These are redox reactions and most biochemical reactions, I don't know if there are any exceptions, most biochemical reactions are redox reactions. So all this is very important when you think about the recycling of nutrients. And some of you may be familiar with biogeochemical cycles. You may have studied it at some point, but that's how the inorganic nutrients, they go through these redox uh, reactions through the biogeochemical cycles. And that's how the inorganic nutrients are completely recycled by nature. Why am I going through all this? When we measure the productivity of any ecosystem, which is our main intent, I want to know how productive a particular ecosystem is. Why are we worried about that? We are worried about that for the simple reason we think about biodiversity, we think about whether a place has um, high biodiversity, low biodiversity, is it important to have high biodiversity, all these questions can be answered based on our understanding of the primary productivity of an ecosystem. So the primary productivity of an ecosystem is what we are going to be looking at in this particular lecture. So um, how do we measure it? Photosynthetic activity can be measured. We can measure it in terms of loss of CO2. We can measure it in terms of oxygen production or biomass production. So these are some of the parameters that we use for quantifying primary productivity. I'll show you examples of all of that. <coughs> like I said, this is an oversimplified generalization of the biochemistry of photosynthesis. That's not important. What is important is our ability to measure the ecosystem's productivity. How, um, before I go to the next point, look at the elements that are shown in this particular reaction. Only three elements are there, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Now these elements, they are important, but water is plenty. This is our planet is a watery planet. So in general, water is considered to be in plenty. There are, of course, local exceptions. And then you have carbon and oxygen. So that's also you might say is plenty. Now, what drives the productivity is the availability of inorganic nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. From an agricultural point of view, the first two nutrients are the most important one because we find that in agricultural productivity, the most um, limiting, most often limiting nutrients are either nitrogen or phosphorus. Then we also have a requirement for sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, potassium, the list, like I said, goes on and on. And we will go through the law of the minimum and cover that as well. Then we come to classification of my, uh, not microorganisms, all organisms. So you can do it in two ba basic ways. One is based on mass, which is carbon. Remember, we are all living in a world which is carbon based life forms. All life forms on the planet have some amount of carbon in them, and that's the basis. So based on carbon sources, one method and based on energy sources, where is the organism deriving its energy from? So if it is carbon, it's autotrophic. Uh, I'm sorry, if it is carbon, there are two types, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotroph literally means self-feeding. They are converting CO2, which is inorganic carbon, to organic carbon, which is biomass. 
Heterotrophs like us, what do we do? We utilize organic carbon that is generated by other organisms. Whether you're a herbivore or an omnivore or a carnivore, it doesn't matter. You're utilizing other biomass, which means you're utilizing other living organisms. The organic carbon is being converted to new biomass. So those are heterotrophs. We feed on other living organisms. Then we come to energy sources. I've already mentioned that you can have photosynthesis. So photosynthesis means the organism is utilizing light energy to create food for itself. Now phototrophs can be autotrophs and heterotrophs. Then you have chemotrophs. There are certain, especially microorganisms, there are many microorganisms that are capable of utilizing the energy released from certain redox reactions and utilizing that chemical energy to generate um, energy for their survival as well as growth and reproduction. So this is a group of organisms that are generally microorganisms. I do not know any examples of higher organisms. And then we come to heterotrophs. All higher organisms like human beings, birds, animals, what you see around you, all the large animals and birds and so on, they're all heterotrophs. They are utilizing biomass generated by other organisms, converting it to food and mass and energy for their own uh, growth and survival. Okay. Um, we can also have ecosystems that are categorized based on other criterion. So we have size, type and biodiversity. What is the size going to do? So those of you who have seen aquariums, home aquariums, you can see aquariums either, you know, lots of different sizes. They are small examples. They are ecosystems by themselves because they have certain amounts of plants. Some of them are photosynthetic. They have a multiplicity of species in them, some microorganisms, some fish and some other species as well. So that's one example. That's a small sized a home aquarium. It's a very small ecosystem. Then you have a lake pond that would have a self-sustaining. It's those are these are all self-sustaining to some extent. A home aquarium, you might argue, is not a self-sustaining ecosystem, but uh, to that extent, you know, the planet gets its energy from the sun, so it's also it, it comes into the same um, point. So let us uh, look at lake, pond, watershed, biome. Now these are just increasing in terms of the size of the ecosystem. So. Um, it does not mean that the system is uh, it does not mean that the system is not getting anything in and out. Remember that system is defined by what is coming in and out of the system. So it's not self-containing. I do not use the word self-containing. I say self-sustaining. It can thrive for a prolonged period of time provided it has sufficient amount of mass and energy coming in and out of the system. It is self-sustaining, not self-contained. Nothing on the planet is self-contained to that extent because we are dependent on solar energy. Um, then we have types. So you can have terrestrial ecosystems and you have water-based or aquatic ecosystems. Within aquatic ecosystems, you can have freshwater or marine water or estuarine ecosystems. Estuarine, as you know, is uh, the interface when fresh water meets the seawater or ocean water. There is a certain uh, salt gradient. There is a salt gradient that is created brackish water, saline water, all these things where it's neither fresh water nor is it 100% seawater. So that's called the estuary or the estuarine environment and that has its own peculiar ecosystem. So the best example of that is the Sundarbans. The Sundarbans here in West Bengal and Bangladesh, they are all examples of estuarine ecosystems. And there are, India's coastline is really long. So the entire coastline has estuarine ecosystems of different types and uh, there are so many examples. Then we come to level of biodiversity. You've all heard the fact that the biodiversity on the planet is 
decreasing day by day there is extinction of species so we are probably estimating that more than 100 spe species are disappearing uh, on the planet so when you think about the most biodiverse locations you probably think about tropical forests and at the other end of the spectrum we have a lab monoculture i already mentioned that let's say in the lab i take a flask i add some nutrients to it i add a pure culture of a particular bacteria that's called a lab monoculture now it's not self-sustaining by no means i have to continue adding nutrients to it and provide other conditions for its um, continued growth so a lab monoculture has a single species therefore the biodiversity level is close to zero it's just one and a field what does a field have let's say a field has rice that is sown on the field what will you get you'll get a few organisms that will thrive in that field maybe some rats and maybe some snakes and a few birds and so on so there'll be maybe 10 to 50 species in the field as you go towards the forest you have temperate forests which are again summer and winter you'll have different kinds of species and different types of um, populations and so on so these are ways of categorizing ecosystems then we come to biomes what are biomes biomes are terrestrial ecosystems where the biological communities are grouped based on the dominant plant form so you can see the entire globe has been categorized in terms of biomes so you have let me show you something else and the defining criteria uh, um, criterion is that these biological communities have a particularly dominant plant form so i'm not going to go into any details we're way out of here so here we have temperature versus precipitation so let's say we have only two parameters that are important and that is temperature and precipitation so based on these two parameters we can define the dominant life form and then categorize these biomes based on that and that's what you see over here so at the extreme right we have the tundra or the arctic region where the temperature goes into the sub-zero zone and the precipitation annual precipitation is also low so that is one extreme then we come to the other extreme where the annual precipitation remains low temperature average temperature ranges anywhere from 10 degrees to 30 degrees or maybe even higher so those are the subtropical deserts and in between you have the grassland and deserts as well the other extreme where the precipitation levels are high and the temperature is also fairly high will give you the tropical rainforest so you can see all the different biomes the terrestrial biomes that are defined on the basis of temperature and precipitation I'll just show you very quickly a few examples of the other uh, types of um, ecosystems that I was mentioning. So when you think about a watershed, it can be the watershed of a small stream or a great river like the Ganga. So you can see the river Ganga watershed, it's huge. It covers, I think, more than seven to ten states. And you can see the extent, the geographical extent. I think it covers about one third of the landmass of the country then we have the coral reefs in the indian ocean you can see the number of species that thrive in these local areas of high biodiversity these are all endangered for uh, different reasons and for different factors mainly pollution and to some extent uh, global warming uh, these are some of the factors that have caused um, problems in the sustenance of these ecosystems so you have freshwater these are the coral reefs are a marine environment freshwater environment so the ganges river dolphin has been considered an endangered species for a long time it's making a comeback now many people are saying that it's doing well right now so all this has to do with reducing the pollutant levels in the river and uh, uh, making sure that these uh, species that these uh, dolphins and other endangered species are not caught and trapped and utilized as food or for other purposes so those are just examples of ecosystems now let's come to ecological hierarchy 
What is the ecological hierarchy? So let's start with a single individual organism. Anytime I take a single individual example, so whether it's a human being, whether it's a bacteria, a bird, an animal, it doesn't matter. A single organism has something that it shares with other individuals like itself. So it has unique morphological physiological and behavioral attributes and that makes it a species so when you think about human beings we all share certain morphological physiological and behavioral attributes we have the same responses to heat to cold to uh, thirst to hunger all these things make us uh, behave in a particular way behavior nothing else and then we have morphological and physiology. How do we get our food? We all get our food in the same way. We all digest it in the same way. We all, um, so that's physiological. And morphological means we have features. All of us have two eyes, two ears, uh, two legs, hands, and all of that. So these are unique morphological, physiological, and behavioral attributes that comprise the species. And this set of attributes will determine the ecological role of that species in a particular ecosystem. So how does a particular species relate to other species and to the environment? That will define the ecological role. I'll come to this point again in a little bit. What is population? So population means how many of these individuals occupy a particular area. So you're drawing a system boundary and you want to know what is the number of organisms that exist in a particular area. So that is the population of a single species. We do not, when I say population, it means I'm referring to a single species. So number or groups of organisms of the same species that occupy a particular area. These populations will then obviously relate to other populations within that ecosystem. They will have interrelationships within the individuals within that population will have certain relationships and their way of dealing with the abiotic part of the environment will also be very particular and specific. And they will also be vice versa. They'll be in, uh, impacted by uh, by physical chemical changes within the ecosystem. So any change in temperature and pressure and um, uh, precipitation, humidity, any of the climatic factors will also cause uh, changes in the dynamics of the population and how they relate to each other. So that is what ecological dynamics is all about. And it's way beyond what we can cover in this course. It's way beyond my ability as well. So I'm not going to go there. So I'll just define, like I said, we're going through basic definitions only and certain examples of the environmental impact of um, any disturbance to ecosystems. So we'll do that as well. Then we come to communities. What is a community? So when I say community of uh, organisms within a particular ecosystem, we're talking about populations of different species. How are different, for example, let's say within the campus itself, what is happening? Within the campus, we have a large number of species, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe more than that. OK, all these species are impacting you can think about the campus boundary as an ecosystem. They are all impacting each other and as vice versa, they are being impacted as well. So populations of different species are affected and affect the ecosystem. So whether they are large or small in terms of either the diversity or the numbers or the area, it doesn't matter. That will determine the flows of mass and energy within the ecosystem. So to put it in very simple terms, the green cover on campus is where the solar energy is being converted to chemical energy and that will also form the basis for the higher trophic levels to thrive. So that's an example of multiple species living within a particular ecosystem. So this will determine the dynamics of the ecosystem, the structure, growth, development, adaptation, homeostasis. Homeostasis means the ability of the ecosystem to be steady. Uh, no matter what the input is, 
as long as the output is more or less steady, as long as the population levels are more or less steady, then we call it homeostasis. Any disturbance to that steady uh, set of conditions is obviously disruptive and can endanger certain species. So these are the things that are very important from an ecological point of view. Then we come to habitat. What is habitat? It's the place or set of environmental conditions in which a specific organism lives. Then what is ecological niche? Now, ecological niche is often confused with habitat, but it defines not only where an organism lives, but also what it does. So you can define it in terms of space. You can define it in terms of how does the uh, organism find its food and how does it become food for other organisms in certain cases, not all. And how so that is energy utilization and transformation. How does it react to physical, chemical and biological factors in the environment? All this comes under the definition of ecological niche. So I'm like I said, not going to go into too many details we have. Let me show you an example of an ecological niche. Now you can, you have two parameters, let's say temperature and humidity. If the ecological niche of that organism is, let's say it's temperature that is important, not humidity, or if it's humidity that's important, not temperature, then you can draw a sort of square around this and this will define the range of tolerable conditions. Okay, so for human beings, we know what my, uh, what is the temperature that we can tolerate. We can generally, under normal conditions, we can normally tolerate, I would say about 10 degrees to maybe 40, 50 degrees, okay, without changing our environment. And then relative humidity, we can probably tolerate the entire uh, range from 0 to 100 percent. So that is the range of tolerable conditions. These are two factors that are independent of each other. So we would probably fit in this scheme of things. There are other uh, organisms, especially microorganisms, that are not going to be able to survive under certain temperature and humidity conditions. For example, most microorganisms need water. A certain level of humidity is required for even for human beings. Zero is not tolerable for a very long period of time. So 30 would be acceptable, but 30%, uh, yeah. Uh, so range of tolerable conditions would be something like this. It would be where there is interdependence between temperature and humidity. So a certain amount of temperature, but if it's zero humidity, they won't be able to survive. If it is um, the temperature goes too far down to zero, then again, they won't be able to survive. So these are the ways you can define the ecological niche of that particular species. So outside, anytime the uh, climatic conditions step outside those boundaries, then this a particular organism will not be able to survive. This is a two dimensional graphic. The first two are two dimensional uh, diagrams. You can have three dimensional diagrams. So in this case, it's temperature, humidity and phosphorus. So plotting it in three directions, you can have a range of tolerable conditions in that form. Now, I've already mentioned in the previous slide that climatic factors are any number of climatic factors you have. Uh, the topography, you have um, wind, you have uh, availability of food, all these things are also factors that will determine the ecological niche of the organism. So it's a, it's really difficult to show in graphical form anything more than in three dimensions. So that's why you have this n-dimensional hypervolume that is mentioned over here, because you have to kind of visualize, if you can, the space, the hyper volume, which is n dimensions, n dimensions being the n factors that will define the ecological niche of a particular species. And these ecological niche is not going to be mutually exclusive. So if you take any ecosystem, you will find that different populations are overlapping in terms of their ecological niche. So that's common. Um, so 
So pH, light, moisture, soil, all these are uh, parameters that will define the ecological niche of a particular species. So then we have food chains, food webs, trophic levels. You've gone through all this. I know you've done this all in your high school. So productivity. Now, like I said, one of the things that we're going to focus on in this particular topic is primary productivity and how do we measure it? So what is productivity? Productivity is the amount of biomass produced per unit area per unit time. Um, I think you know what a food chain is. So a simple food chain, you have um, corn, uh, a type of grain that will be taken up by chicken or any other birds. They will lay eggs and the chicken and egg both will be consumed by human beings. But the way I've written it, it's a simple food chain. What is happening in reality is a better example where they have interrelationships. So this corn is eaten not just by the chicken, but also by the grasshopper and the human being. And this chicken can become food uh, for the human being and the grasshopper can also be food for the chicken. So these are interrelationships that cannot be captured by the food chain. So that's why we have the food web and we have trophic levels. So let me show you an example of trophic levels. So here we have trophic levels. Now at the bottom of this trophic pyramid, we have our primary producers. So the health of any ecosystem is 100% and 100 dependent on primary productivity. That is the base of any ecosystem. So when you think in terms of productivity, I've written these letters NPP, we'll come to them later. I'll show you this slide again, but just look around you and think in terms of how much biomass or what number of species, uh, number of individuals of a particular species are there. Um, how can you measure productivity? Can it be measured in terms of oxygen, carbon dioxide consumption? What are we trying to do? All these things. Regardless, what are the primary producers that you can see around you? So we are terrestrial animals. If you look around you, the most obvious primary producers are green plants. So when you look around you, you know that this is the primary, uh, this is the base of the pyramid, and these are the primary producers. But if you look at aquatic ecosystems, in aquatic ecosystems, you have algal cells. Algal cells are that layer of green scum that you see on aquatic uh, ecosystems, on lakes, on ponds, reservoirs, all these things. So they are the bulk of the primary producers in aquatic ecosystems. So you can think in terms of biomass. Biomass is literally you take up whatever is visible, measure it after drying, and that is the dry weight of that organism per square, um, per unit area, okay? So that is the way we measure biomass, especially in aquatic ecosystems, this is a very common method. You can also do it for fields. You can do it. It's difficult to do for forests, very difficult. You can, uh, that's where we use remote sensing and so on. We measure the green cover and that's an estimate of the biomass and so on. So the, that's possible. Then you have productivity. How do we measure productivity? Uh, so I will come to that, like I said, in a little bit. OK, now that is the base of the pyramid. In all cases, this these are the primary producers that are at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's our first level. What is the second level? The second level is the herbivores. The herbivores are utilizing whatever is generated by the producers. So they are dependent on the producers. And what is important for you to notice over here is the logarithmic shrinking of the pyramid. It's natural because the amount of biomass that is generated at the next level, it's, a, it's all about the inefficiency. Nature does not care for efficiency. Efficiency is something that only human beings care about. Nature does not work on the basis of efficiency. It works on the basis of increasing biodiversity, increasing um, barriers, or rather, I shouldn't say barriers, increasing, um, no, 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 um, 
creating uh, sets of um, situations where you know the destruction of one species will not destroy the ecosystem. So those kinds of um, I'm losing the word that I want to use, but yeah. Uh, so those are herbivores. So you can see the shrinking of the pyramid. The numbers have gone down tremendously from 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 4. And then further up the pyramid, you have two orders of magnitude and then another one order of magnitude. OK, so this is natural and it's understandable because the efficiency by which biomass remember this biomass that is produced at the bottom is food for the higher levels so there is natural inefficiency because this food has to serve as a source of mass as well as energy for the higher level so this is nature at its uh, under natural conditions undisturbed by human beings why is it relevant from the point of view of environmental science? So I'm now going to go and talk about something that is slightly different from what you may have done in the past. Um, you have all heard about the fact that there are pesticides or certain other chemicals that are thrown out into the environment and they affect, uh, they cause toxicity not only to the species that they are intended for, but also to human beings, to birds, to other animals and so on, right? So these are examples of what we call bioaccumulation and bioconcentration. And that is where our understanding of the food pyramid becomes important. So let us say I am using a pesticide to kill either mosquitoes or um, uh, flies and so on. So there are so many pestilent species that I want to destroy that are in my environment. So I use a particular pesticide. Now, what is the impact on the ecosystem of using a particular pesticide? So what you see over here are controlled lab experiments to understand how 41 different chemicals behave. So they have used a single species, an algal cell called chlorella. They've used a single algal cell, uh, algal species, and they've exposed these algal cells to 41 different chemicals. To understand what is called the ecotoxicological behavior of chemicals. So before I show you more about this slide, let me also talk about a chemical parameter. Now we have a chemical parameter that is called KOW. This is the octanol water partitioning coefficient. Now the octanol water partitioning coefficient means you take a particular chemical, any chemical, it may be DDT, it may be transmethrin, it may be endosulfan, it may be any pesticide that you are familiar with. You take that pesticide, put it in N octanol, and then put it in two separate experiments. You put it in either octanol or in water, and you compare the concentration, the solubility of that chemical in either octanol or water. So the concentration in octanol divided by the concentration in water is called the octanol water partitioning coefficient. Because these chemicals tend to have numbers that are 10,000, 100,000, the concentration sometimes is that high in octanol compared to water. So you can see DDT. If we write it in log form, so if I write this as log KOW, the number I get is 6.91. So that means 10 to the power 6.91 is the multiplier in terms of the solubility of DDT in water compared to octanol. What this means for us is that DDT, let's take DDT as the example because I work with, uh, I don't literally work with DDT, but that's been studied a lot more than any of the other compounds. Now DDT is known to be hydrophobic and this value 6.91 is the reason we call it hydrophobic. It doesn't look at the solubility in water. In water, it's practically insoluble. While in alcohol, in octanol, it's extremely soluble. It's 10 to the power close to seven times more soluble in octanol. How does, how does that make any impact on all, all of us? So let us see how that matters. 
our bodies are made out of organic compounds. So is the algal cell, so is the bacterial cell, and so is every other living organism. We are all organic in nature. So if we are all organic and the compound is hydrophobic, it will prefer to dissolve in the organic material, our biomass, the plant biomass, the animal, fish, mosquitoes, flies, whatever it is. It's all organic biomass, right? So anything that's hydrophobic is going to move away from water towards organic biomass or what we say tissue of the organism. So that's why I'm showing you this data. So you have log octanol water partitioning coefficient, which is a chemical parameter, strictly chemical in nature. And what they found in their experiments with these algal cells is this clear linear correlation between the bioaccumulation factor and the octanol water partitioning coefficient. So you have an independent chemical uh, parameter against a independent biological parameter and the two are clearly correlated with extremely high R square values. What does that tell us? It tells us that the log KOW value is directly indicative of the bio concentration potential of these chemicals. So all these 41 chemicals that they chose in their study are potentially bioaccumulating chemicals. So they are hydrophobic, they tend to bioaccumulate in the algal tissue. In this case, all the experiments are algal cells. But the, this is the proof that these hydrophobic chemicals can accumulate in the tissue of organisms from microorganisms to higher organisms. They are all capable of bioaccumulating and that is what makes them toxic. So when I'm killing a mosquito using a particular pesticide, that mosquito will die, but I'm also exposing myself to very, very small amounts of that same chemical. And over an extended period of time, maybe 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, God knows how long, depending on many other factors, there can be, can be toxic impact on the human beings that are exposed. So when you have occupational hazards, let's say farmers who are using the pesticides, spraying it over their fields, not using protective equipment, so they are all at higher risk. And we are also at risk when we use these chemicals. But like I said, the mosquitoes have to be destroyed. So what's to, what's to be done? Let's find other examples. So this is one of the biggest um, examples. Now this is, um, this is one clear example of bioaccumulation. Now I should have said one more thing, and that is what is bioaccumulation or bioconcentration factor. So this factor is the concentration in biota divided by the concentration in water. So you have bioaccumulation factor. You can see the correlation. The two factors are both ratios. And one is a ratio in biological tissue and the other is a ratio in octanol versus water. Uh, this is only one part of the story. So this is from water to algal cells. Algal cells are the primary producers. These primary producers, let's take a look at the trophic pyramid. So imagine that there's water at the bottom of the pyramid. From water, it goes to algal cells. From algal cells, it may go to fish and birds. And from fish and birds, it will go to the higher birds and so on. So that is how the chemical will uh, eventually accumulate. So we use three terms, bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, biomagnification. So the concentration is increasing as you go up the trophic pyramid. So these are bioconcentration factors and it does not happen just to chemicals like DDT. It happens to many other chemicals, including uh, metallic compounds. So you have arsenic and other compounds, not as bad as ED DDT. It's, um, DDT has a bioconcentration factor of 54,000, while arsenic and related compounds have 44. So all of these are examples of bioconcentration factors of several different chemicals. There are so many, uh, the textbooks, the literature is full of all these kinds of data and it's important for you to understand 
all of this. So uh, to complete the story about bioaccumulation or bioptake, let's just call it that. So let's say water is below the pyramid. You have phytoplankton, algae as well as aquatic plants that are the primary producers in an aquatic ecosystem. These phytoplankton are going to be ingested by zooplankton. These zooplankton are insects, worms, larvae, and so on. These insects, worms, larvae, whatever they are, are going to be ingested by small fish. So these minnows are very small fish, the finger-sized uh, fish, and these minnows are going to be ingested or eaten by larger fish and birds. So you have the pickerel and the tern. So these are birds and fish that are feeding on the minnows, which are very small fish. And in turn, these uh, birds are not necessary. Uh, terns are not going to be eaten, but the minnows are also going to be uh, ingested by other birds. So these herring gulls, merganser, they, they might even feed on some of the larger fish and so on. So this is how any contaminant or uh, let me rephrase any pollutant in the water will travel up the food pyramid because of this and you can see that as the biomass decreases the concentration i'll show you examples of that this is from a particular textbook um, by henry and heinke and uh, i think it's called introduction to environmental engineering and science i've forgotten the name i'll put the name in the reference list um, so this is a table that shows you DDT levels. So DDT levels in water are five times 10 to the power minus five ppm. ppm is milligrams per liter. In the plankton, you can see how many orders of magnitude. Three orders of magnitude have, there's a three orders of magnitude increase, which means 1000 times increase in concentration in plankton. Then you have in the minnow, it's a, just about the same. In the larger fish, the pickerel, it's another order of mag, uh, two orders of magnitude here. In the tern, same level, about the same order of magnitude, but slightly higher. Same thing for the gulls. And finally, the fish eating ducks, one more order of magnitude. So you can see how as the, um, as the uh, biomass at the top decreases, the pollutant is going to be increasing. So because remember it's hydrophobic, it prefers to be in organic tissue. So that is the main thing. And this is an example of an organic compound. The same thing happens with toxic heavy metals as well. So this is an example of cadmium. So you can see the fern. Fern is an aquatic plant. You have duckweed, hyacinth, fern. These are all aquatic plants. Then you have zooplankton, you have snails, fish, and sediment. So you can see the concentration factors, the bioconcentration of various contaminants, pollutants, contaminants, whatever you want to call them. So these are, this is why it's so relevant for us to know at least a little bit about ecology to understand what is happening in the environment in terms of pollution. OK, uh, let's take a two minute break and uh, two to five minute break and then we'll continue with the rest of the lecture. Right. Any questions at this point? Any questions? You can post them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and ask me right away. No questions? Okay. Um, so like I said, let's take a two minute break and then I'll be back.
Hello, yeah. So I'm back. No further questions. I can start. Yeah. OK. Right. So then we come to our next major topic, and that is primary productivity. So what I said initially was uh, what I just went through is about how an ecosystem can get damaged. What are the consequences for higher organisms in any ecosystem if there is a contaminant or a pollutant in the system? Now let's take a look at how we measure the health of any ecosystem. So like I said, what is the driving force? The driving force in any ecosystem is solar radiation. So as long as there is radiation, uh, as long as there is uh, solar radiation, you know that that is driving the growth within the ecosystem. So let's take a look at that. Solar radiation that's coming outside the atmosphere, you know that it's getting attenuated as it passes through the atmosphere. So we have our solar radiation, so you can see the spectra. This is the entire electromagnetic spectrum for solar energy or solar irradiation. And there are three levels that are shown over here. So the first curve is solar irradiation outside the atmosphere, then at the sea level. So this tells you how much is being attenuated simply because of passage through the atmosphere. So you can see the peak. The peak is getting uh, it's modified quite a bit. The range of light or radiation that reaches the surface of the earth is more or less the same. So there's no major change all the way from 200. Um, uh, from 200 to uh, 3000 micrometers, it's nanometers, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so that's nanometers, correct. Um, so this is the range. So we have spectral radiation and this is outside the atmosphere and this is at the sea level. Now, why are we uh, looking at this curve for the black body? The black body in the R case is the sun and the temperature, the average temperature of the sun is 5800 Kelvin. So you can see the similarity. The curve for the black body, which is generated based on theory, is very similar to the curve for the actual solar irradiation. So that's why we say that the uh, black body in our case is the sun. It doesn't look black, but it's a black body here. It's radiating energy from inside into space and to other planets and so on. Yeah. So the solar flux on an average is a constant. So from year to year and so on, it remains more or less the same. So that's 1365 watts per square meter. However, for a local point, so you have different points on the planet and at different points in the year, so spatial and temporal variation. So you can see, uh, So you can see different times of the year and different places on the planet. So at the equator, you can see there's very little fluctuation in the solar flux. This I think is a percentage of the total flux. Yeah, so uh, wait a second. These are actual totals. So um, that is at the equator versus as high as 80 degree north latitude. So Spitsbergen is uh, 80 degree north latitude. You can see very few um, months of the year they have light and therefore the solar radiation is much, much less. So there are local, there are what we call spatial and temporal differences. And these differences are basically uh, due to location as well as season. So these are daily as well as annual cycles. So day and night cycles and seasonal cycles are what you see in terms of solar flux. 99% of solar flux on the planet, on the surface of the planet is between 136 to 4000 nanometers. Half of all that radiation, 47% is in the visible region. So again, let's take a look at that. 
So this is the visible. We define the visible region as 400 to 800. Yeah, so 380 to 770 may be more exact or 400 to 800 nanometers. Out of this visible, um, that is the visible range. Outside the visible range, you have 7% in the ultraviolet radiation range and you have 46% in the infrared region, okay? And then we come to what happens to all this light energy? What is this having an impact on? So there are three things that happen. So you have the radiation coming from the sun. This is incoming solar energy. So let us say that is the total amount of energy coming to the planet. What happens to it? Three things, reflection, absorption, radiation. So whatever is being reflected off of various surfaces, it can be reflected by the atmosphere, by clouds or from the earth surface. All of that is one part of the um, loss. So that's 30%. Much of it is absorbed. You know that when light falls on water, on soil, on grass, whatever it is, it's being absorbed. So the water temperature rises, the soil temperature rises, all that is absorption of light energy. So this is absorption by land and oceans, and that's about 51%. There is some amount of absorption by clouds, by the atmospheric components, all this is absorption. So that's the orange color. And this heat that is absorbed by either water, soil, anything that is there in the atmosphere, particles, clouds, all of that, what will it do? It will eventually radiate this energy back into the space and atmosphere. So this is radiation that is carried to the clouds and atmosphere by latent heat as in the term, in terms of generating water vapor. So that's 23% then into the atmosphere and directly out into space. So these are the three processes that happen to the solar energy after it falls on the planet. We're interested in measuring primary productivity. We know that green plants and algal cells are our main primary producers. That all, if you take a global look at the ecosphere or the biosphere, what are we dependent on? We are completely dependent on algal and green plants for biomass generation, okay? So that is dependent on the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. You can have bacterial chlorophyll, you can have algal chlorophyll, you can have different types of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, B, C, D, it goes all the way, I think, to G or H. But let's take just one example, and that's chlorophyll A. Of the solar energy that is incident on the surface, the plants are reflecting green and yellow. Why do they look green? Because that's what they're reflecting. And why are the other colors not visible? Blue and red are where they are absorbing most of the solar energy. So green and yellow are being reflected and uh, blue and red are being taken up by the plants. And this is the solar energy which is converted to chemical energy and then utilized for making new biomass. So this is about 20%. Now plants, even though this particular source says 20% we've done, you can do different calculations using different parameters. It can range anywhere from 5 or 10%. I'll show you an example from the Kormandi textbook where he says it's only 0.1% of the total solar energy. So depending on how the calculation is done, Depending on what parameter you're measuring, you'll find that nature does, like I said, does not work on the basis of efficiency. It works on the basis of uh, survival. The main objective in all cases remains survival of the species. Little bit more about producers and photosynthesizers. So all autotrophs are producers. All producers are autotrophs by definition. All autotrophs are not photosynthesizers. I don't want to go into any details, but whatever I said about photosynthesizers, they are definitely autotrophs, but some of them are lithotrophs as well. And they are, as far as I know, they are all microorganisms. Um, so within these producers, we also have two more categories. We are all familiar with plants and algae. The other ones that 
generate oxygen. So we call them oxygenic um, producers. There are other microorganisms. They are pigmented bacteria like cyanobacteria, blue-green algae and sulfur oxidizing bacteria, purple bacteria. They are anoxygenic uh, microorganisms. So both of these groups coexist on the planet and the fact that the atmosphere today is an oxidizing, it's got a huge amount of oxygen in it and this earth atmosphere which has huge amounts of oxygen was not um, always there. Life started under reducing conditions when oxygen was not present on the planet. Okay, It is because of photosynthetic organisms which actually were born much later, um, far later compared to the anoxygenic microorganisms. It's only because of these oxygenic microorganisms and higher plants that today we have an oxygenic, um, oxygen containing atmosphere. So if these primary producers, the oxygenic primary producers, if their population starts decreasing, oxygen levels on the planet will also drop. And the consequences for species like ours, which are dependent on oxygen, will also become evident. Then we come to productivity. So here we have radiant solar energy, assuming whatever is coming in is 100%. Assuming further that 50% is available to the primary producers at the autotrophic level. This is a general estimate. I think this is mentioned in Cormandy's book. There are three terms that are used to measure productivity. So you have gross primary productivity, net primary productivity and respiration. If you think about a field, a green field, you have solar energy coming to the field. Some amount of that energy is going to go into creating new biomass. So when you harvest the crop, that is NPP. So NPP is net primary productivity. It is based on the standing crop or biomass of the photosynthetic organisms that are growing on that field. What is the rest of the solar energy going for? The rest of the solar energy goes into respiration. So respiration is the energy that is consumed by that crop in metabolizing uh, its own biomass and generating new biomass. Uh, again, I'm sorry, without generating biomass. So gross primary productive, I think it's easier. Let's uh, move away from plants, but maybe it will cause more confusion. Um, so I think you understand broadly that whatever energy is falling on a, let's say a square field of a very um, specific area, the so all of that solar energy is not going to go into the biomass. Let us assume that whatever biomass is harvested is pure glucose. You know the delta G value for pure glucose. You know that that is the amount of energy locked in that chemical. Now, all of that is not equal to the solar energy. Remember, nature is not 100% efficient. It's very, very poor in terms of efficiency. So the 50% of the solar flux on the field is going to be utilized and less than that is going to be used for producing biomass. And gross primary productivity is the sum total of what goes into producing the biomass and R is respiration. So respiration is the energy that goes into uh, conducting all the other activities without generating biomass. The, I think you all know transpiration, right? You know the uh, you know the dark and light cycles of photosynthesis. Anyone to answer that? No. Um, Let's say as a human being, I eat, I consume a certain amount of food on a daily basis. Whatever I consume is more or less the same. It's more or less a constant. Where is that material going? So for a person who's, let's say, a grown up adult whose weight and height and everything is more or less fixed, it's all going into respiration. OK, but let's say you take a small child. 
a child is growing in terms of height and weight. So the biomass is increasing. So for that child, the amount of food utilized partly goes into biomass and partly into respiration. OK, so that is how I can explain these three terms. But if you find it confusing, let me know. Let's come to the next point. We want to think in terms of primary productivity and biodiversity. We want to know which areas are most biodiverse and you will find that biodiversity is directly correlated to primary productivity. So look at the numbers in terms of net primary productivity. So when I say harvest biomass, Let me take a break and stop this noise just. OK, um, I can't stop this noise, so we'll have to continue. Um, but I hope you understand that NPP is the biomass that is generated. So whether I harvest the crop and um, take the weight of the crop or whether I convert it to carbon equivalence or whether I just um, find other ways of measuring productivity, it may be chlorophyll production, it may be uh, oxygen generation. There are several methods of measuring primary productivity. I'll show you a few of them. So here we have net primary productivity in terms of carbon per square meter per year. And you can see the <coughs> you can see the area in millions of kilometers on the planet that is occupied by these different ecosystems. So you have the open ocean at the bottom, which has almost nothing. It has very, very poor primary productivity. Extreme deserts, rock, sand, ice, all the all of them. Very poor productivity, not zero. None of them is zero. Remember that life exists in every part of the planet. But the biodiversity levels are very, very poor in certain cases. And then you have the ocean, algal beds, coral reefs. These are sites. These are local areas of extremely high biodiversity, followed by tropical rainforests, swamps and marshes, tropical seasonal forests, estuaries. So you can see the entire list. OK, so Terra, even though we are a watery planet, the biodiversity is higher on land compared to oceans. So I think I've explained all of this and how you understand the relationship between trophic levels and productivity pyramids. Now these are global uh, method or again, sorry, these are methods that can be used for measuring primary productivity over the entire globe and a fairly long period of time. Now you all know that satellite data and satellite images have been used for more than 50 years, yeah, uh, far more than 50 years um, to generate data for the entire globe. Now, the advantage of having a satellite is that it goes around the planet very frequently and it generates a lot of data for the entire globe at a very uh, high frequency. So you get what is called uh, high uh, temporal and spatial coverage and uh, you also can see changes. So when people talk about climate change, global warming, they're mainly relying on satellite data for monitoring all these environmental factors, including primary productivity over the entire globe. Now I'm just showing you one example of net primary productivity, kilograms of carbon per square meter per year in summer versus winter. So June in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's actually global, it's northern, uh, it's summer and winter only in the northern hemisphere. So you can see the colors. The purple area is zero productivity. The red areas are high productivity. So in the northern hemisphere, the highest productivity is in summer. You can see in the temperate latitudes, 
it's very red. The oceans in both cases remain purple, very poor productivity. So whatever I've said here in this chart, this is old data, has been uh, confirmed and verified by satellite data. So you can see all of that. So this is summer in the north and summer in the south. December is summer in the south. So you see the equatorial region and in the south you can see the high productivity in December. Like I said, you can use different methods of uh, estimating NPP, net primary productivity. So here they have used phytoplankton pigment concentration. Now satellite data, you can only measure color, right? You can see the color, you can measure the color and the uh, intensity of color. So in this particular case, you can focus on terrestrial environments. In the second case, you can see the ocean environment. So the high productivity levels around the coastlines in the northern summer versus in the northern winter. You can see the shifting of colors and it just shows you how much higher productivity is there during the summer season compared to the winter season. Now you're all familiar with these things. Everyone knows all these things, but this is just to show you that phytoplankton uh, can be measured with satellite data to understand primary productivity levels all over the globe. Local methods, very simple. Let's say I have a lake in my backyard. I want to know what is the primary productivity of the little lake or pond that I have in my backyard. I can't rely on satellite data for that, right? So there are simple methods. Phytoplankton are the largest group of primary producers. Remember our uh, photosynthetic equation, I can measure either the rate of oxygen production or the rate of CO2 consumption. So I can focus on either of that or I can focus on biomass. Both of all of them are possible. I'm showing you one example of what is called the light and dark bottle method based on oxygen production and consumption. Oxygen is fairly easy to measure. We have uh, titrimetric methods, chemical titrimetric methods are there. We also have electrode or electric sensors, electrode based sensors. Both methods are equally acceptable <clears throat> and uh, they are fairly easy. It's easy to set up a titration. It's easy to buy an electrode sensor for oxygen measurement. So this is a fairly well defined method that you can use for simple science projects and that kind of thing. OK. So here we have light and dark bottles. If you know about the BOD bottles or any bottle that can be water sealed, you suspend the bottles with the water from that particular uh, aquatic body. You put it full and then seal it. And before you seal it, you measure the C0, the initial oxygen concentration. So you have to measure two things. One is the initial concentration of oxygen and the final concentration of oxygen. And you can have a period of 24 hours between the two measurements. So it will go through a light and dark cycle. Now, one crucial difference is one uh, bottle should be transparent, completely glass, transparent glass and the other should be tinted. So if you know that you have these dark tinted amber bottles, you should use a, a dark bottle. What is the difference between the two going to be? The one that is transparent will allow sunlight to come in. So you will get uh, photosynthetic activity in the light bottle. The amber bottle will prevent sunlight from coming in. No photosynthesis will happen. And whatever change you see in oxygen concentration will be because of non-photosynthetic activity. So mainly respiration. OK, so the change in the light bottle will be delta C. That will include photosynthesis and respiration. And delta C in terms of oxygen in the dark bottle is due to respiration only. So we now have a measure of delta C, so respiration only, so C dark is C0 minus CD over T1 minus T, T0, and then NPP includes both photosynthesis and respiration. So the two together um, will give you GPP. 
and NPP includes photosynthesis plus respiration. So you can do the calculation and come up with all three parameters. OK, um, we then come to the last part of the uh, topic, and that is population growth models. If you have any questions, ask. No questions. Are you all listening? OK. Right. All right, so let's start with population growth models. So we have uh, the first one is what we call the Monod uh, kinetics or the Monod model for bacterial growth in batch cultures. I've already mentioned a couple of times that if you take a flask in the lab, add some nutrients to it, add a uh, bacterial inoculum to it, and monitor the growth of bacterial cells over a period of time. You can do it over two days, four days, maybe a week. You're likely to get a curve like this. OK, now this is what we call a standard bacterial growth curve. And why am I showing this to you? Bacteria are definitely one species, but many species in the environment follow the same growth curve. OK, and I'll show you another one, and that is the logistic growth model. So they do resemble each other, but they're not the same. They're very, very different. Mathematically, they are very different. The underlying theory assumptions, everything is different. So even though they resemble each other, they have nothing much in common. So it's very important to keep both of them very clear. Let's take a look at the bacterial growth curve. Now, before we come to the growth curve, let's define our terms. Growth is defined as an increase in number of cells. So today's methods, we have the ability to, we've had the ability to measure the number of cells for almost 100 years now, and uh, we can measure the biomass, we can measure the weight of the biomass, we can measure the number of cells, all this is well known. Growth rate is the change in cell number or mass, whether you measure it in terms of weight or whether you measure it in number, uh, in terms of number of cells. Either way, the change in number of cells or weight per unit time is going to be called growth rate. Now, if I generate a curve like this, I have log number of organisms on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. You have the lag period. Now, you might say, why is there this change in the curve? So the lag period is because of many reasons. This is the time required by the cells to acclimate themselves to a new condition. And most of you are at home right now, so you don't have to acclimate yourself to the new conditions in campus. But when you do come back to campus, you know that it takes a, maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe one semester before you adapt yourself to the new condition. So any organism that has to deal with new environmental conditions will find that it takes time. And so with these bacterial cells, they're not going to reproduce right away. So the number, the increase in number or biomass is not going to happen right away. It's almost constant. It doesn't change very much. So you have an old culture which is in stationary phase. You may have an exponential. If the old culture is in exponential phase and the nutrient media is exactly the same, there will be no lag. Otherwise, the inoculum may contain damaged cells. It may be transferred from one nutrient uh, set of conditions to another nutrient set of conditions. So in all those things, there will be a lag phase. So these are the reasons why you have a lag phase. Then comes a point when there is complete adaptation. So the bacterial uh, population has adapted itself to the new conditions. At that point, it will start rapidly reproducing and you will get an exponential increase in the population. So you have this exponential increase. There comes another point 
And at this uh, in the exponential phase, the growth rate is much greater than the death rate. So there will be cells that will die. There will be cells that will be damaged, but the growth rate is far higher than the death rate. And that is going to be a function of several factors, temperature, nature of the media, the nutrients available and the genetic traits of that particular species. At one point, you will find that the growth rate becomes equal to the death rate. At that point, you will find that the curve starts leveling off. There is no further increase in population. So that is what we call the stationary phase. So in this stationary phase, it and what is the reason for the stationary phase? The reason is that there are no more nutrients. Let's go back to this curve. So this is 10 to the power 5. It has gone to 10 to the power 9 or slightly higher than that. That is the amount of nutrient that is available in the flask. It cannot, after all, it's a finite amount of nutrients. There's no infinite supply of nutrients. So at this point, this is what that flask can sustain. So this is, you might want to call it the carrying capacity of that particular flask. Now, if all were to continue uh, growing and some amount of cells were to die, that would continue forever, but that never happens. In reality, what you see is a death phase because these nutrients get exhausted, certain toxic end products of growth and survival will start increasing. And because the environment gets polluted, even in a little bacterial flask, I can tell you what happens in a little bacterial flask, the pH goes down, the acid level goes really high, the pH goes down, these bacteria can no longer survive in that environment, there's no oxygen, the pH is low, and they start dying. So what happens in reality is this curve very often has a very short stationary phase and it starts depleting right away. So that I can tell you from experience. And then we have increased concentration of toxic byproducts, which will result in a death phase. And that death rate will be much greater than the growth rate. And that's why you have this phase. OK, so these are the four phases that you see in uh, bacterial cultures, we call it uh, the Monod model and um, so that's about it. And then we come to the next model. The next model is the logistic growth curve. Now, uh, I don't have my tablet with me, but I said in the last class that dn by dt is equal to kn. Right, so that's our exponential model. So I've already explained the exponential model to you. That can be, uh, let's let's keep that exponential model in mind. So dn by dt is equal to kn. That k, that little k, we are assuming is going to be a constant. And that is what you see over here. That's the exponential phase. So if I want to model just the exponential part of that, then that works. dn by dt is equal to kn, you integrate it, and you get n is equal to n0 times e to the power kt. So that is exponential growth. However, I want to capture this part of the curve. And like I said, they have some similarity. They look similar, but they are not. There is something called carrying capacity. There is something called environmental resistance. Now, no environment is infinite. You have a finite amount of resources and that finite amount of resources will sustain only a certain level of population. And like I said, I do not have what I need to show you is basically a curve. Let me see if I can show that to you. Um, yeah, so it, this is what happens in a logistic curve. You have growth and as the population increases, the growth rate decreases. The growth rate is highest at the beginning because the population is lowest. My N value is close to zero. So the amount of resources may be infinite. From a practical point of view, the amount of resources available for this early population is infinite. They are growing fastest 
the growth curve, the slope of this curve is highest. As the population increases further and further and further, the growth starts slowing down because the resources are no longer infinite. You're coming to the limit. And as you come closer and closer to the limit, which let's say is 700 uh, cells in this case, these are yeast cells. This is actual data for a yeast. You know that yeast is a microorganism that we use in fermentation. So in making alcohols and in making breads and so on. So this is yeast. And uh, yeah, and the carrying capacity for this particular culture in the lab, this is a lab culture uh, data set, that is 700 cells. So you can see it's going, it's leveling off, it's reaching a limit. And at some point, the growth rate becomes zero. And that is the hallmark. So for that culture, for that flask, this value, 1 minus n by k, where k is the carrying capacity. So this is this is the carrying capacity. 700 might be considered the carrying capacity. And have this factor incorporated in this equation. So instead of k, we now have R0. What is R0? R0 is the instantaneous uh, exponential rate of growth at time is equal to zero. So it's an it's no longer a constant. Remember our rate growth rate for this new curve for the logistic growth curve is no longer a constant. It's constantly changing. And how is it changing? As the population gets closer and closer to the carrying capacity, its growth rate starts decreasing. So R is equal to R zero times one minus N by K n by k 1 minus n by k is called environmental resistance because as you are as the population gets closer to the carrying capacity the growth rate slows down so this is the logistic growth curve which incorporates uh, both factors the carrying capacity and the variable growth rate and remember the hallmark of the logistic growth curve is it is fastest at the beginning and slowest or close to zero at the end. So when N is very, very low compared to K, so that is the beginning of the growth curve. OK, at this point, what happens? You have exponential growth. You can this N by K, this N by K factor is very, very small, so I can ignore it. I can throw it out and I'm left with my normal exponential model. So dn by dt is equal to R0 n. So this is my R0, the initial exponential growth rate. As n gets closer to k, r starts approaching 0. And this is your integrated form. So n at any time t is written in this form where Capital K is the carrying capacity, 1 plus B, B is K minus N0 by N0, and exponent minus R0 T. I will give you some problems to solve so that you can, in fact, you know, one of the things, you have the data in front of you, you should try to replicate this curve by yourself so that you get a feel for it. So for the same data, so I have time and cells and this we do frequently in the lab. I can measure the number of cells over a period of time. It can be yeast, it can be bacteria, it can be algae, it can be any number of microorganisms. We do this on a regular basis. I can calculate dn by dt and then from that I can calculate r. So uh, I can also do a few other things. If I plot dn by dt versus n, not time, but the population, I will get a curve like this. So it has a peak and a decline. This point is, this peak corresponds to k by 2. So this population at which dn by dt is maximum is k by 2. So this is the um, inflection point of the logistic curve. Uh, uh, so here we have R0, which is maximum in the beginning. So if I plot R versus N, maximum at the lowest population, as the population increases, R value decreases. This is a monotonic decline. So for this particular data set, you can see a monotonic decline, which means 
there's no fluctuation. It's going down, down, down and no other change in direction of the curve. That is the hallmark of a logistic curve. If you have a non monotonic decrease, for example, if you take India's population growth over the last 100 years, I've given you the data in the last lecture. If you take the entire data set, it's not a monotonic decrease. However, if you take the data starting from 1971 to the current year, then you will find there is a monotonic decrease. And that is because of policy interventions. There are government policies. There are there's education. There's public awareness campaigns mm -hmm. telling people to curb population growth. So all these things have contributed to uh, a reducing growth rate, which was not the case prior to 1970. And uh, these are all uh, things that are to be understood in terms of the logistic growth curve. So you have to have a monotonic decrease in growth to fit the logistic growth uh, growth model. And what else can I say about this? Yeah, so remember two points. Growth rate is maximum in the beginning and the R value is a variable, not a constant, unlike the exponential model. So certain uh, points that can be made. This model is applicable to any number of species. Many papers have been published with different species. So why am I talking about it in ecology? It applies to human population to some extent, to bacteria, to yeast, to flies, you name it, many of them fit it. Not all species fit the same model. Okay. Uh, like I said, even the human population in India or the US, I've given you another example coming up. So we'll talk about that. It applies to those populations where there is a monotonic decrease in growth rate. That doesn't always happen for various reasons. You can have diseases, you can have wars, you can have other national natural uh, disasters. All these things will contribute to non monotonic decrease in population. So when you have these kinds of episodic events which cause entire populations to decline or to grow, depending on what the reasons are, it throws all these models out. Um, so regardless of all these things, this what is often mistaken, this part of the S curve, this part of the S curve is often mistaken for the lag phase. It is not a lag phase. This is the fastest part of the logistic curve and this is a true lag phase and this true lag phase happens only for batch cultures and reactors and lab cultures all these kinds of things so those both are facts of life the reasons are very different Uh, so the initial part of the S curve is not the lag phase. It's the nature of the logistic curve. It's the fastest part of the growth curve. For populations where the growth rate varies over time and non monotonically, for example, India in the last 100 years, it could not be applied. But in the last 50 years, it can be applied. For the US population, there was a famous paper, very famous paper, and I'm showing you the data for it. You can use this data in your spreadsheet and come up with these answers. If you're unable to come up with these answers, we can talk about it in the next class. So you have population data, and if you use this population data, you'll find that the carrying capacity for the US as far back as 1920 was calculated to be 313 million. They far exceeded that as well. Now, I should say one more thing at this point. This model, the logistic growth curve model, assumes that carrying capacity is a constant. That applies to a flask, a yeast culture, bacterial culture. The carrying capacity of the flask is definitely fixed. What happens in human societies? In human societies, we find ways and means to increase the carrying capacity all the time. So we are adding infrastructure, we are adding uh, methods of putting in more people in smaller spaces. You look at the urban centers, we have uh, 
<laughs> we have these skyscrapers that are growing. And what does that mean? It means more people per uh, square foot of land area, right? So these are ways in which we are constantly increasing the carrying capacity of our urban environment by providing more infrastructure. So one of the major assumptions of the logistic growth model is that the carrying capacity is constant. But the fact of the matter is for human populations, it's not a constant. It's a variable. So determine the carrying capacity for the US. Will the population, uh, what is the year in which the population reaches 200 and 300? None of these predictions came out to be correct. Uh, and that is because of many other factors. Many other factors resulted in wrong predictions. But excuse me, as an example of the utilization of uh, the logistic growth model, it works. Let's stick to bacteria. They are an important set of microorganisms. I can deal with them. They are less variable in their behavior compared to human beings. So that's uh, how it works. So let's say we draw a logistic growth curve for the following data. So we have an initial population. We can estimate the carrying capacity of the, of the flask. And we know that R0 at the beginning is 0 0.5953 per hour. So you have to determine the time at which the cell population will stabilize. So when will it level off? So my answer is 25, but if you want to say 20 or you want to say 30, that's perfectly fine. But as long as you have a number somewhere close to this. OK, so that brings me to the end of this lecture. And this is the time for you to ask me whatever is not clear. All right, somebody has said something in the chat box. Uh, yes, ma'am, nothing, no questions. OK, no questions. OK, um, so I think I'm going to be uploading an assignment or giving you a quiz or something like that. Um, you're all familiar with Moodle, right? Yes, ma'am. A few answers, OK. So let me decide whether to use MS Teams or Moodle for your assignments and quizzes. We'll have to work on that, yeah. Any preference? My model is on MS Teams. No, there's no point. Somebody has suggested Google Forms. I'm not going to go with that. We have only two options: MS Teams and uh, Moodle. My model is very. My Moodle takes a lot of time to upload. You don't have to upload anything. It'll be MCQ type. In either case, these will be MCQ type questions. Um, uh, still, Moodle is very slow. Sometimes it takes more than five minutes to load to the next page to see the next question of them. So MS Teams is not slow, but Moodle is slow, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. OK. All right, we stick to MS Teams then. Yeah, I know Google Forms is the fastest. I do realize that I have done that also in the past, but um, let's see. So I mean MS Teams, it will be louder, like please. MS Forms. I can't hear you. Yeah, on Teams, it will be like uh, MS Team Form. No, I can't hear you. Ma'am, he's asking if it will be in a MCQ format in a form. Yes, yes, yes. It's going to be in an MCQ format, yes. 
even the numericals will be in MCQ format. Okay. So no further questions. Okay, then. Thank you. And uh, I will stop if there's nothing else. Yes, I will be uploading the slides and I think I've already uploaded the last class, right? So I'll be doing that for the uh, for this one as well. Yeah. So one more question, when is the quiz? Um, uh, the Institute guidelines are that we should have a test um, one in the first week of February and then in the first week of March, April and so on. But I may give you an assignment uh, before that. OK, just to give you a feel for what is required. Yeah. Ma'am, can you please upload first week's slides as well? Because we are not able to find it on uh, MS Teams. There is only a supplementary folder file and materials. Okay, I have to do that. Okay, I have forgotten about that. OK, so yes, I will uh, upload the slides as well for last lecture as well as this one. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Right, you're welcome. Well done. I think so. All right, so I'm closing the meeting and we will be meeting again at the same time next week, right?